What are the key principles of sports rehab and how can you best apply these principles in ACL rehab and overhead sports injury? How do we most effectively utilise load management in rehab and during return to play? Well, in today's episode of Physio Discussed, we discuss these things and much more with our two amazing guests, Dr. Ted Wilsey and Dr. Travis Pollum. Travis, Teddy, thank you so much for coming on to Physio Discussed. Welcome to the uh, the long form of this podcast. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us, James. I'll look forward to being able to be verbose here and not have to keep things succinct. Absolutely. Yeah, we've we've got time to really delve into some of the, the topics in more detail than we do in, in our brilliant but shorter form version of Physio Explained. So today we're going to be talking all about sports rehab, which could take us down so many avenues. But the beauty is we've got 45 minutes or an hour to, to go down those avenues wherever we see fit. And, you know, what better two guests to have on uh, with a, a real special interest in research and, and practice in sports rehab, load management, and all the things that we're going to talk about t- today. So we're going to get started straight away because we need to make the most of this time that we've got. <laughs> um, and we're going to be talking, first of all, about some of the principles around sports rehab. And Travis, I'm going to kind of throw this straight at you, if that's OK, and just talk us through what do we what do we mean by the principles of sports rehab? Well, I think that, the you know, it's it's really about what is the the foundation of our practice right and what are what are our guiding principles and so uh my my area is really the research side of this uh and so a lot of my focus is on testing uh like return to sport testing but also i i come at it from a a pre-participate pre-participation standpoint as well and so you know when i think about okay athlete is needing to get back to whatever sport what are the demands of that sport where do we need to get them by the end of this and where are they starting and then how do we how do we get them from a to b so for me that's kind of like principle number one um and then tied into that would be a lot of you know foundational strength and conditioning principles that uh really i mean we can we can i'm sure dive more deeply into this but uh, you know, coming at from an academic perspective, I'm I'm very uh, involved in undergraduate education, but I also kind of work with students who are going into uh, doctor of physical therapy programs. And just my understanding is that the the education on that side of things, the strength the strength and conditioning side of things, is relatively underwhelming. So. Um, Basically, how do how do we marry strength and conditioning with rehabilitation to get athletes prepared to go back to their sport? That's kind of how I think about it. Brilliant. I, I think you've touched on a really important and it's and it's really interesting to hear you say that, because I think in the UK, there's a similar thoughts around under, undergraduate physiotherapy degrees, uh, not necessarily covering as much strength and conditioning and exercise prescription as some clinicians think they should. I think um, it's difficult. It's a three year degree over here, so it's hard to to cram everything in but i think actually for the listeners which many of them will be students and new grads talk just i think let's just delve in a little bit more about the strength and conditioning um teddy you 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 pump the air straight away as soon as travis mentioned strength and conditioning go on tell us a bit more about that principle and how that fits into to what travis is talking about there well you know i i come at things from the lens of a strength conditioning coach turned physio and a lot of what I do is finding ways, looking through that physio lens to apply these strength conditioning principles, whether it is uh, considering how fast they're moving, that could be VBT, velocity-based training, considering how much work they're doing and how that's influencing the recovery, that, come down, that comes down to workload management. More of that is uh, on the strength and conditioning side of things if we want to dichotomize thinking about return to performance, not just return to our activities of daily living. Again, that is more uh, the research on it, the the knowledge on it is much more robust on the strength and conditioning side than it is on the rehabilitation side, if we are to dichotomize these. So when when I think of principles of sports rehabilitation and some of the work that I've done on it, uh, really I kind of break it down to the strength and the adaptation piece of it which is very much strength and conditioning driven. 
the goal-driven plan of care and needs analysis that comes with an athlete with an athlete's demands you know do they need to run on the pitch for five or six miles a game 10 kilometers or are they playing american football where they're just doing quick bursts a uh, very different approach at the end stage of rehab uh, the careful balance of stressors and workload management and then finally uh, what travis mentioned that testing and return to sport uh, are they from a local tissue status and a zoomed in uh, status, like looking at the knee, the quad strength after a quad or patellar tendon graft, are they able to produce enough force uh, com compared to the other side? And that's why I kind of pump my fist with strength and conditioning because, uh, and I'll tell you, I was a, I had an undergrad degree in exercise science. Even in that world, most of the education is based on the general population because that's the majority of the people out there. It's on health promotion. It's trying to make our population of the country or the world healthier, which is really important work. Strength and conditioning is niche. And so if you want to get a high level education in that, you have to do it through uh, self-education, internships, that sort of thing. You're not gonna have any university that, that spits out a high level strength and conditioning coach. You're just gonna have time to learn the, the basics, the physiology, uh, a few early ideas, and that's it. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I view the principles of sports rehabilitation very much uh, governed uh, or through a lens of strength and conditioning. Yeah, uh, I think that's what you, you've touched on there as well. I think we we always undervalue strength and conditioning as a topic and a subject mm -hmm. by saying it should be just sandwiched into a physiotherapy degree. Uh, it's 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 massive, and when we take the true strength and conditioning subject. As you say, people specialize in that. Uh, you, that's why we've got strength and conditioning coaches. That's why physiotherapists really should be using their strength and conditioning coaches uh, for the skills, mm -hmm. not necessarily just trying to become watered down versions of that. But I think there are some key principles in those in that strength and conditioning which apply to sports rehab uh, recently I've just you know looking at uh, Claire Minchel's work and the masterclass that she's done and really focusing on those principles, those core elements of strength and conditioning, which actually can be applied to some of our other general population, um, which I think is really interesting, actually, and in how we can pull a, pull those 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 elements through. Element you, you picked up on there, Teddy, you talked about this uh, dichotomy of, of strength and conditioning and physiotherapy and rehab. The, the term sort of uh, that I quite like and be interested to see what you guys think as well is, is rehab is uh, training in the presence of injury. What are your thoughts mm -hmm. on that? That uh, I can't credit. I know that has come from somewhere, someone. So apologies to the to the person who first uh, said that. But but what are we thinking on that one, Travis? You, do you agree with that sentence? Yeah, I I like that. I think it it streamlines and simplifies the process, right? Because it you know without that, it's like well, it feels like I have to reinvent the wheel, <laughs> and and that's really not the case. It's like okay, I I understand strength and conditioning. You know, I have a background in strength and conditioning. Now, maybe I layer on my physiotherapy education and I can put those two things together and all right, now I can rehabilitate an athlete. But the trouble is that oftentimes people are uh, forced to work with that population without that training. And then like Teddy said, it's it's really about picking up those skills on your own because there aren't so many places where you can really acquire those skills all at once, especially in the context of physical therapy education. Uh, it sounds like in the UK, it's very similar to what it is in the US is like, maybe you get a lecture or like lucky if you get a, a whole course, um, but you you certainly aren't getting the, the two or three year education that you could get fully in strength and conditioning. And then yet you are, well, you know, I have this physical therapy, physiotherapy degree, therefore I can rehabilitate anybody because it's a generalist degree. But then we, what we learn is that uh, that doesn't really uh, shake out so well when you, when you talk about, well, here's what we should be doing with athletes and here's the current status quo. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think rehabilitation in the presence of pain if you can understand like, well, rehabilitation is when you're working with athletes, strength and conditioning in the presence of pain, then you really, if you have those two expertises, then you're really well equipped to do the work. Teddy, any, anything to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I've, uh, among other people, I've definitely used that, that line about uh, rehabilitation really just being training in the presence of pain or injury. 
uh, because it's it's hard to dichotomize or know where to draw the line. You know, most higher level athletes, people that have been doing this for a while, they have pain, they have injury, they still have to train around it and through it, but they're not always rehabilitating, you know? And so there's, it's hard to really draw these lines like, uh, like the old school coach that said, uh, are you hurt? Or are you injured? You know, and these silly kind of usage of words in ways that, that they aren't necessarily made to be used. Um, at the end of the day, whether you're training or rehabbing, and if we have air quotes there, you're just trying to, to find what your entry point is and make progress from there. Uh, I think that as Travis mentioned, like the, the entry degree or, or what you start off with, that can get you pretty far if you're working with general population. But once you start to get to a sports uh, environment or athletes that need to perform at higher levels, there's this whole other litany of types of exercises, ways to apply them, and demands that come into play that you don't necessarily have to think about in general population. And it's not to say that the general population is easier. It's absolutely not. If anything, your quote unquote success rate or your outcomes might be even lower than they would be normally, which can be very challenging and emotionally challenging, especially when you're a new grad and you're going through that and you're seeing a lot of patients in a day. Uh, but at the same time, there's probably a fewer uh, number of exercises and different things that you need to do with that population, less that you need to know about in terms of like all these different athletes and different positions and different uh, injury patterns and common common issues that you see across sports. Uh, so yeah, I think it's I think that um, again it's hard to draw that line. When, where do we go from rehab to training? Uh, but it is important, as you mentioned, James, to understand that we're not we as physios are not grandfathered in to being strength and conditioning coaches simply because we have a degree that might have more letters behind it or might look higher on a totem pole of education. You know, it's very important to respect the individual disciplines. And even myself, as somebody who was a strength and conditioning coach for years, I, I respect the fact that like, I haven't gone to a strength and conditioning conference and sought out that information solely in over a decade at this point. And so I don't consider myself to be uh, at the top of my game for strength and conditioning is the same way I would for being a physical therapist. And so I'm fortunate to work in a multidisciplinary environment where I have strength and conditioning coaches that when I'm reading about pathology and differential diagnosis, they're reading about force plate data and load management, and they're really deep into their world. And so I do think it's important no matter where you are in your, in your career progression to respect the, uh, you know, the, the, every individual's expertise. I love that. I think that's really well said, Teddy. And I think you mentioned there that multidisciplinary approach. We see it in the healthcare system all the time. You know, we, we you know, physios work, working on the wards with ill patients, as it were, we couldn't do without, and we wouldn't even think about not working with the nursing staff, the occupational therapists, the doctors, etc. So in a sporting environment actually we should be thinking very very similarly actually utilizing the the skills and the specialist areas of the team around us for the person that matters the most and that is the athlete at the end of the day which brings us really nicely back around to the principles travis you you spoke about right at the beginning there and thinking about the goals and what are we wanting to achieve with that athlete with that sportsman or woman to to return them to or to get them to excel where they want to be uh, um so and that's going to lead us on to to some of the key topics we're going to talk about in a minute so teddy travis anything you want to add on to principles so this the actual principles before we start looking at how we're going to apply these to some populations i i think two things that were mentioned that are, are really interesting are one the idea that like you know where where is where does rehab end and training begin and there, there's a really cool graphic and i i'm totally blanking on the paper now but it's like the the utilization of physical therapy for acl rehab which i'm sure we're going to talk about um and it's like the number of visits you know obviously declines over time uh unfortunately declines probably too rapidly relative to the timing of when an athlete is ready to return back to sport seven nine eleven twelve months post injury or surgery or whatever but the idea is okay well when rehabilitation is kind of dropping down mm. strength and conditioning or training should be picking up and maybe that's one person who's doing all of that um 
maybe it's not, maybe you work in an interdisciplinary clinic and you have access to both practitioners and you can just, you know, kind of do that handoff and still be involved throughout the process. That's kind of like the ideal world. But I think the challenge is that a lot of times you are only one physiotherapist and maybe you don't have access to the person to hand them off to for the training part of it, the strength and conditioning part of it. And so like, if you are doing all of it, then you really do need to be comfortable wearing all of those hats. But I think what we often find is that the physical therapist, physiotherapist has the specialty in rehabilitation. They see the knee, they address the deficit at the knee, and either they don't have the the resources, the environment to do the training piece of it or the knowledge, you know, or or some combination of those things. So, hey, the the knee, shoulder, whatever, uh, you're out of pain, you're able to do your activities of daily living. Uh, it seems like you're good to go, but then there, that's a far cry from where yeah. that person actually needs to be to return to practice or competition or the, the same level of performance. So it's like you said, James, it's when you're in a, an inpatient acute setting, the nurse is right there. The occupational therapist is right there. Uh, not to say that interdisciplinary practice is easy, but at least you're, you're running into that person every day, right? <laughs> yeah. To, to network with the strength and conditioning coach or, or create the system where you have everybody working with that athlete is really hard in an outpatient orthopedic setting. Uh, and I think we, we see the ramifications of that often. Yeah, absolutely. Anything to add before yeah. we move on, Teddy? You know, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head, Travis, because it also, it takes extra time. Just from a practical and logistical standpoint, it takes time outside of what your normal treatment hours are. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, we are not reimbursed uh, or or compensated for that extra time. And so that's a that's a major barrier, uh, particularly uh, if you know when is this case is likely the person that you're trying to communicate with. It also takes extra time for them, and they might not get back to you. you might have to stay on top of them a little bit. So that can be really hard to coordinate. But yeah, I mean, realistically, when you work with athletes, you're typically, uh, most athletes are under the age of 25. Uh, the majority of them are under the age of 20. You're typically coordinating with parents. You're coordinating with uh, maybe a coach, maybe multiple coaches. If they're like in a club and a, and a school league, uh, you're coordinating with, um, you know, athletic trainers, maybe, maybe a, a athletic trainer from school. I mean, it can be quite a few people. And, and particularly when you talk about ACL, Sometimes they might see a few providers throughout that time period. You know, I work in this multidisciplinary sports environment and we're out of network. So we see a lot of people that come over around three or four months post-op and they stick with us until that, that eight to nine month um, time when we start to, you know, hopefully get them cleared and get them ready to go. Mm. Uh, the one other like principle I would add in the sports rehab world, and this is exactly what Travis was saying, but just, just being, keeping an athlete uh, prepared. To get back out on the field you know i i in my master class i broke this down as i just it's kind of arbitrary but tier i called tier one exercises ones that are more local and specific to the injury itself and then tier two are everything that's more global or around the injury uh there's no reason why you can't really progress and get somebody very strong at a single leg deadlift when they're still pretty restricted with their knee over toe type of movement or their mm -hmm. anterior knee loading you know there's no reason why you can't keep a grade two hamstring uh, injury patient in shape so that their cardiovascular conditioning doesn't severely drop over a two week period, which we know it does, uh, because they might get back out on the pitch in two and a half weeks. If we look at the research behind grade two hamstrings. So uh, I think it's extremely important to whatever we call it, tier two work around. Um, and it might be education. It might be that you're giving somebody these tools to go do on their own, because even if you're a physio and you're only seeing them for one or two hours a week, this is somebody that's coming off of a, a three or four hours of, of gameplay or two or three hours of practice most days of the week. So they really need to, to stay in shape mm -hmm. and to uh, maybe use it as an opportunity to build up other areas of the body if it's a longer term rehabilitation. Uh, so I think that's an extremely important aspect, uh, keeping the big picture goal in mind for sports rehab. And I see those things as like somewhat huge challenges, right? Uh, depending on what environment you work in like you said if you have the, that patient for an hour or two a week all of that other stuff that you mentioned is really like work that's not necessarily under your jurisdiction so 
from the standpoint of, all right, contacting, being in touch with the other providers, the surgeon, the athletic trainer, the sport coach or coaches, especially maybe if it's a sport that you haven't worked with a ton to just like get a better handle on that. But then, yeah. Uh, okay. So they're a knee injury, right? But they have the other leg, they have the upper body. You have an hour or two. What, like, when are you going to figure out what, what, what to tell them to do and like when to do it? So it's, it just is the, the, that is the best case scenario, right? Is that you're treating the entire athlete, especially from the standpoint of, well, here's where they have to be. Uh, just because they have this one deficit doesn't mean that they shouldn't be doing all those things. But this is the thing that we're hyper focusing on right now, necessarily. But when are we going to find the time to program the rest of the stuff and to execute the rest of the stuff is a huge challenge. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. I think we're leaving you know, really. Thing, yeah. Sorry, go on, Teddy. Go I, on. I was just gonna. I was just gonna mention, like, it just kind of came to mind, like, you know, we. I discussed or mentioned how young a lot of the people are that you're working with when you're working with athletes. Uh, as you know, as I think as a lot of strength coaches go in further into their career, they really focus on communication and thinking about how to really connect with their athletes. I think that um, a lot of health promotion work in general is more is just as much focused on how to get people to do it as it is what they're doing, because we know that that's so important. And when you're working with athletes, uh, some of those first questions need to be like, okay, if I'm giving Travis, if I'm giving you extra work to do outside of here, where are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? What, what, what time of day are you going to do it? What, what fields or things do you have access to? Uh, do I need to text it to you? Are you not going to see it in your email? You know, do I need to send you a PDF and, and remind you to save it to your notepad? Like all of these silly little things really come into play when you talk about implementing sports rehab, because you're working with young people and it's just so different. Like working with a, uh, a competitive athlete is a, a 19 year old competitive athlete who's so immature and has, you know, is a completely different experience than working with like a 30 year old professional athlete. So yeah. there's a lot that, a lot to consider there in terms of implementation of the actual work. Is that implementation, but you, you mentioned in there, Teddy, is that compliance and adherence? which, yeah. you know, we can have the most incredible rehab plan, the most incredible periodized strength and conditioning program. But if they don't understand why they're doing it yeah. and they don't want to, or they're not bought into it and you haven't mm -hmm. communicated that with them, then you've wasted all of your education, all of the specialist skills you've had and all of that time. So I, that's, I think it's so, right. so important. Yeah. Right. Really and important. not to be pedantic, but I think it starts before we even think about the words compliance or adherence. I think it starts with alliance being on yeah. the same page. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that. Once, yeah. once I'm upset about somebody not complying or adhering to what I give them, it's like it's I already lost them yeah. at that point. <laughs> <laughs> it just if you're and not on the same age. page. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. That, that that perfect program is only perfect in a vacuum, right? It's the perfect right. program for the person in front of you based on what they told you their willingness to do was. Mm -hmm. Yeah exactly exactly definitely so shall we let's dive into some specifics now um as best we possibly can and thinking about the principles that we've talked about and, and we, we we've really dived into this really nicely actually and we're going to take this now into a really very hot topic of research uh it's an area that i know the three of us have all got an interest in um and yourselves an incredible amount of of knowledge and specialist skills in, in research and practice and that is acl rehab and it's something that we see an awful lot talked about on social media it's a really hot topic i think if you, is it not just me that's seeing that at the moment yeah I'm getting some definite nods there and let's think about our principles and and how we can apply these in acl rehab so who wants to kick us off on that one uh yeah i will i'll kind of start off and uh i forgive me for staying very kind of broad and, and generalized here, but, you know, I think from a principle standpoint with ACL rehab, strength and adaptation, like the four principles that I kind of laid out are strength and adaptation, a goal-driven plan of care, careful balance of stressors, workload management, and then the testing return to sport. Mm -hmm. Starting with the strength and adaptation, ACL rehab is, I mean, there's, there's no other rehab that you see such profound weakness and loss of force output an arthrogenic muscle inhibition from a neurological level. There's no other uh, injury that I'm aware of that causes the same degree as ACL does. 
yes, I've seen some people that really struggle to to regain like shoulder flex, active shoulder flexion after a labrum repair or a, a traumatic dislocation. Like I've seen other really bad stuff, but and I'm just speaking anecdotally here, but man, ACLs they just come out of that surgery sometimes so profoundly weak and deconditioned and loss of ability to create force. So the strength and adaptation is so challenging for them because you're you're working through injury and you're trying to decide how much tendon pain, how much anterior knee pain is okay. Uh, you know, at the end of the day though, they have to regain that force output or else they're gonna be at a severely increased risk of re-injury and they're not gonna be able to perform. You know, if they can't do it, even if an athlete says, I can't do this or that on the field, it might come back to that, what's your quad doing? Is it is it sufficiently decelerating you? Because if it's not, nothing else is going to work well, you know? And then from an ACL, like the goal-driven plan of care, that's where you get into uh, specific positions on the field, specific, specific sports. Where are they in their season? You have to start to think about this stuff too. Like I with every ACL rehab uh, evaluation, I'm already looking forward to where, where are they gonna be uh, in their competitive season at nine months? What are we gonna be up against during that return to play time period? And I'm already talking to them about what I'm gonna need from them, meaning percentage testing numbers, that sort of thing, to try to lay that out at the beginning. Uh, and then the careful balance of stressors is, is particularly challenging when they get into that late stage. So that Travis, like that paper you're talking about with the graphic, and I'm not, I'm not sure which paper that is, but you know, one thing that you see a lot is when they, when athletes start to get into their return to play activities, their testing numbers actually get worse because they're less focused on strength and force output at that time. And they're more focused on getting back into sport. And they have other factors that might increase swelling in the knee, decrease force output. And sometimes we even see that on the unaffected leg as well which tells us that there's a, there's a really um, suboptimal balance of stress at this point in time, if they're losing strength in, on both sides. You know, so it's really important to, to have raw numbers, not just percentages that you're looking at over time. And then finally, as uh, we've alluded to throughout this, the testing and return to sport decision-making. You know, whether you're using an inline dynamometer, uh, you have access to an isokinetic dynamometer, uh, those are both really good tools. One costs $100, the other costs $40,000 US. Uh, so you can imagine a lot more people have the inline dynamometer. But at this point in time, uh, where we are with the research, I, I, it's implausible, implausible to me as to why, how somebody would have a explanation for not testing an ACL uh, return to sport athlete. You know, So that's an extremely important part of the process. And uh, please understand that a jump test uh, it, or a triple hop test, rather, I should say, to be specific, is not synonymous or uh, exchangeable with a force output test. Mm. So those are kind of the, those are the, yeah, those are the main principles and kind of how we look at it through the ACL side of things. And it's a long journey and you got to prepare people for that at the beginning. And one last thing I would add is the, the, uh, the mental part of it. Right. And so I mentioned a few things about like therapeutic alliance, but that is so important. You got to keep these teenagers engaged for the long run. You got to get to know them uh, and, you know, really kind of their confidence and their trust in you and their relationship with you uh, will make a difference for their long term outcomes and, and whether you're able to keep them on the same page with you when they're itching to go back, but their numbers are stagnant and they're just not ready yet. A lot of hard conversations and tears can happen uh, throughout the ACL rehabilitation process. Definitely, definitely. Travis, over to you. I I echo everything that Teddy said. I um I I think that one of the interesting things, and I can't even remember who I heard this from, but he was talking about like the equipment that you have in your clinic, right? And uh, you know, Teddy mentioned, do you have a dynamometer? Like nobody has a nice to connect dynamometer, but uh, at the very least you have a handheld or they make these pin deck um, force monitoring devices for rock climbers that you can hook up to your iPhone and like you can do the leg extension, like hamstring curl, you know, pretty accurately for a hundred dollars and there's no excuse. Um, but the, the conversation that I was having was like, if you don't have 
a leg extension leg curl machine or access to one or the athlete doesn't have access to one during their ACL rehab, or if you don't have these force monitoring devices, you shouldn't even be advertising yourself as a physical therapist or a clinic that does ACL rehab because it's like essentially malpractice. And like, that's a, that's a harsh reality or a hard line to draw, but I think it's the honest truth. And yet we see, I was just talking to a friend the other day, new grad, relatively new grad, uh, her clinic doesn't have any of these force measuring devices and they often work with these athletes. And so, you know, she's aware of this and wants to make the case for why they need these things. And I'm sure that that is not atypical, but it's it's so frustrating to hear that uh, because step one is having the devices. Step two is doing the measurements serially. So not just at nine months, but at as early as you can and as often as is make sense so that you're you're not you're not just looking at a snapshot of a skier going down a hill but rather how fast are they going because we have multiple snapshots so that we can kind of forecast here's where you were here's where you are now here's the speed that you got there what can we expect oh you just started going back to practice like teddy said maybe there's some swelling maybe there's some deficits that are occurring as a result of ramping up you're actually a little bit lower how do we now balance what well, we still need to be continuing to strengthen alongside the sports participation that you're doing to make sure that we're keeping that number high. So if you don't have the device, step one, but step two, like figuring out the best practices for these things, something that Teddy mentioned too, that I thought was really, is really profound is not just an LSI, you know, we all hear that's the gold standard 90%, but like, is that unaffected side really the best yeah. benchmark? Or do we, you know, want to look at these raw numbers? But even that is like, I don't necessarily know of good normative data on that. Like, I'm sure, Teddy, based on your clinical practice, like you understand like a body weight ratio of what a good number is for a male athlete, mm-hmm. a female athlete at, at this age for this sport. Um, but that's, I don't, nece- I haven't seen a paper that came out with all of that, right? So uh, that's where like the rubber meets the road of, okay, I understand that this is the, this is what the gold standard in research says is the testing. It's probably not just top testing. If you're just doing that, if you're, if you're not testing at all, okay, at the very least start hop testing, but you should also be doing strength, but then the best ways to do the strength and where to find the information about how to interpret those tests and then how to use that information to guide that return to sport decision-making and to ha- how to have those conversations is like a very big challenge in this. Brilliant. Okay. We, we've, 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 we've hit on some sort of real kind of key things there uh, and, and mm-hmm. Travis you can see there that you know that you, you're really passionate about this and actually from the both of you seeing this in in practice and, and as you say people out there who are yeah. doing this I'm going to be you know throw this out there there's going to be some people listening to this episode right now who will be treating and rehabbing ACL patients and they might be in in the UK in an NHS setting or they might be sort of privately working who aren't doing this um and Mm -hmm. we're thinking okay and they'll probably have some opinions about what we're saying here so let's talk to that i just want to have just five minutes to talk to those people now who are listening to this who are thinking well i'm not using a a dynamometer um i don't think i'm testing enough as travis and and teddy are telling me here so what would you say to them in their first steps to to move forward with their acl principles of of sports rehab uh i I will, uh, just one thing real quick on the normative values. Uh, A number that's thrown out there, Travis, sometimes is, uh, I'm sure you're familiar, is like the three Newton meters per kilogram. And and that is an idea. And so you're looking at relative force or torque production, Newton meters per body weight. And uh, if you, you know, if you do the equations and you put that math in, then you can kind of start to have an idea. Like if somebody is looking at 90%, but they're a 13 year old athlete and they're only at 1.2 newton meters per kilogram at both sides. And they're at 90% at four months. You're not going to clear them at four months because we know that's kind of negligent practice. And then you're, let's get both of those numbers. 90% is fine, but let's get both of those numbers up to 1.8. 
or two Newton years, you know, whatever it is. Uh, so you got to understand that what if you're comparing crap with crap, then you're you're not going to get the best idea, you know. Uh, and we know the rate of retear quite high, and half of those retears are on the contralateral side. Uh, we've had this dozens of times in our clinic over the years, where we're comparing a two two and a half year post op ACL as our as our one value against a <laughs> eight month ACL as the other one. That's not going to be a great number. You know, so so the the newton meters per kilogram can at least start to give us an idea of strength relative to body weight. Uh, but yeah, um, mm. and what what James to to go forward and if we're not testing, if we don't have those resources, I think the obvious first thing is to implore uh, the decision makers in your place of work to potentially consider this. Um, the easy force made by Malak is three hundred and fifty USD. The, I just looked these up. The Tindec. Uh, these are both inline dynamometers. You're going to get a much more reliable reading than you would with a handheld. Uh, the the tin deck is two hundred and twelve dollars US. So these are not extremely expensive pieces of equipment. Um, that's kind of the obvious. If you are not able to implore or convince the decision maker in your clinic, and it's not something that makes sense for you to potentially fund yourself or bring in or put your license on, et cetera. Uh, there are some other clever ways that we could at least look at some power production. So vertical jump with an app using our phone camera. Mm -hmm. I think that that's probably going to be your, your most uh, helpful way to look at in-stage return to sport numbers. So I kind of worked backwards here and still trying to find a way to test in some way. Because at the end of the day, if we're not testing in any way, I don't know what numbers we're using to clear people. We're just guessing. If yeah, we don't even have access hand. to that. Yeah, if we don't have access to that, uh, at least quad girth measurements in multiple places and some sort of maximal rep repetition single leg test, which is like what they taught me in physio school over a decade ago at this point. Uh, but at the end of the day, you got to test. You got to test mm -hmm. maximal output, not endurance, not 10 plus repetitions. I, I've had some pretty extensive conversations with Tim Rowland from Physio Network about this. Uh, it's his bread and butter. and uh, we we talked about testing uh, from the context of I have a return to sport app for ACL rehab or late stage rehab and, you know, how to uh, empower athletes to do this on their own in the likely event that they don't have access to this equipment. Uh, best case scenario, they have access to a leg extension and leg curl machine at a gym. And the, the key point is it's not how many what weight can you do for 12 reps on each side? That's not strength, right? It's like, what weight can you do for five reps on each side? Maybe four, six, somewhere in that ballpark. And then if you don't even have that, what, what movements are you going to do in the gym and making sure that you're loading them up heavy enough or, or at home, if you can have access to at least some sort of weight, so like a single leg squat, single leg hamstring bridge, not perfect, right? Because it's not isolating those muscles in the same way that the the single joint movements are. Um, but how how can we, in the, the worst case scenario that we don't have force measuring equipment or machines, how can we get at some understanding of what the strength is relative from side to side? Mm. I think that's, and that, you know, Again, it, but then you could argue if you, if you've got a handheld dynamometer, an inline dynamometer, that's great. But if you're not um, being robust in your testing, then also you you know you're going to get extraneous circumstances in terms of um, slack in the in the cord or something like that. So I think in terms of it's all very well just having one, but actually investing in knowing how to use it's pretty important as well. Yeah, and it's not trivial. Like mm. you, it, it does require practice with the setup yeah, yeah. and the and the right equipment. Uh, so find YouTube videos, seek out mentors to and, and practice, 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 because the reliability, making sure that you are consistently and accurately measuring those is huge. I think um, yeah. I'll, I'll put we've a note on, on this. Just just a quick one on this one, Teddy. Just mm -hmm. we, we've just recorded an episode with Claire Minshall on exactly that on how to use a handheld dynamometer for Great. clinicians, um, and it's a one of our short form ones, and it just goes through the things not to do and the things just to do that are really simple that can make yeah. a massive difference. Sorry, Teddy, yeah. carry on. Uh, I was just going to say, in terms of quality control and reliability from one <laughs> testing environment to the next, we've built 
in both of our clinics, we, we've uh, I've built testing stations that are essentially yeah. wall mounted miniature squat racks that are uh, about 36 inches wide. And then we put the box in the center of it. We've got pin pipes that, that stray that span across and then we hook the dynamometer up to it. So I've built a, a whole station for this quality control. And it just also speaks to how often we're testing people. Uh, so I think it's extremely important to have a repeatable environment. And, th and that also speaks to the tester themselves. They need some familiarization with the testing protocol. Otherwise you're not gonna have a reliable number. And so, uh, you know, sending somebody out to do a test once is not gonna give you nearly as good data as if they are doing this test regularly. Uh, and please remember too, that testing is not just for us. It's also for them. Our, our athletes, you know, I speak to how young they are. Uh, they're used to testing. Like our, our education systems in the Western part of this world are all based on testing, test, test, test. Athletes and young people, they wanna know their numbers. They wanna know where they are. They wanna know where they stand. It motivates them. It keeps yeah. them coming back. Uh, after a good testing, you know, let's say we're doing some sort of athlete monitoring, which is in the strength and conditioning side. After a good test day, uh, you know, they're going to be really fired up for the next few weeks to come back. And it's a long, arduous grind, the ACL mm -hmm. rehab is. And so uh, this can kind of keep them going. And if, unfortunately, they don't have a great testing day, nothing's going to sneak up on us. I always tell my, my patients that in early, early stages of any rehab nothing's going to surprise us or sneak up on us. We're going to know where you are leading up to this. I'm not going to just say, oh, you thought you were going to be back today? Nope, surprise, you're not. Like, they're, they're going to know. And so if the testing's not there, if it's, or, or sorry, if the good good numbers that we want and the number of progression's not there, we, we uh, will have an opportunity to intervene and change whatever we need to train, change and tweak and, you know, the whole iterative process of rehab. Uh, mm -hmm. So testing is extremely important, not just for us, but for them too. That's really, yeah, and that you can give nice full circle back to that, that relationship you have with the athletes to have that yeah. regular communication, that regular check-in uh, and that buy-in, but also, uh, as you both said there, in, in terms of not just waiting till, oh, we think you might be ready to return to play. Let's do some testing. It's a case of having that a bit more regular, which, uh, you know, is, is great. Mm -hmm. So I'm, as, as much as we've got ages, I'm aware the time is flying by. There is one thing I just wanted to very quickly get just touch on here, which is, a, is an obvious answer to this, but for listeners, I just wanted to touch on it. And is with ACL rehab and, and, and sports rehab is this moving away from time to criteria based. Is there anything you just want to just give me a 30 second snapshot on that one there? I mean, it's something I think we should be knowing that we're moving towards, but any thoughts on that? If you're only basing the decision on time, I think the from the last 10 minutes of conversation uh, that it should be quite clear that that is not enough. Uh, but it's not to say that time has nothing to do with it, right? There's research that shows that the, the longer you wait up to a certain point in some studies, but in other studies, just like the longer you wait uh, up to like two years, the the lower your risk of re-injury or contralateral injury. So it's, it's both of these things. Um, it's the, hey, let's make sure that nobody's going back at six months anymore. Like we're we're way beyond that understanding. And I, and I, I recognize the challenge working with young athletes. They've seen the, who was it? Adrian Peterson um, led the league in rushing six months after his injury. Like most of luckily, our athletes. Luckily we're, we're dating ourselves. Cause that was, you know, at this point <laughs> yeah, that was a while ago. Our, <laughs> yeah. Our athletes hopefully now don't even know who that is, right, which is, which right. is helpful. Right? Um, <laughs> because we should only be saying, Hey, this is a, a nine to 12 month process, but also like if we're doing all of that testing once a month, let's say nothing should be surprising us about where we're going to be at that time point. You know, we, we know where we're heading uh, so that when we say, all right, we're targeting this point of the season to return, which would be nine months, which we feel pretty comfortable with or 11 months or whatever it is. Uh, and the numbers are trending in the right direction. And we have maybe two months in a row of numbers that are are above our, our benchmarks coupled with the, you know, the subjective experience, then that that's how we use time together with the subjective criteria and the objective criteria from our testing. Brilliant. Yeah. You know, the challenge that I run into in this sometimes or we run into in our practice is that 
the person that uh, actually operated on their knee, that's wearing the white coat, that yeah. generally carries more of uh, more influence, maybe just because they're they don't know the the patients don't know them as well. You know, the orthopedic surgeons who I'm referring to here, uh, when that person inevitably clears the athlete somewhere around six, seven, eight months we oftentimes have to have this conversation. Hopefully we've built up enough of a rapport by then that the athlete just kind of knows exactly what the deal is. Uh, but we sometimes, and, and there are some surgeons that we work very closely with that, that don't actively work against us, work against us, but there are a few that do. Uh, we just kind of remind people like, look, that's great that you're medically cleared and that everything is healed inside. Now we just want to make sure that physically you're ready to go and you're not quite there yet, if, if they aren't. You know, and so exactly. we, we sometimes try to draw that distinction as uh, independent practitioners that should be autonomous to a certain respect, to a certain, and um, just remind our athletes if we need to, and if we need to have those convers hard conversations, remind them that uh, their risk is significantly heightened if they uh, do decide to go back at X or Y time period that they're not ready for. Perfect. And it's, that's a, that's not an easy conversation to have, like, like, like no. you said, because this is the this is the surgeon, right? This is the person who operated on them. Right. They there is a certain understanding of what the the surgeon seems to be at the the top of the totem pole, um, for for various reasons, and right. they hear from the surgeon, oh, the surgeon cleared me, and like yeah, the the surgeon looked at your the integrity of the graft. They they did a Lockman test or whatever. They kicked it. They had to kick into their hand. <laughs> And uh, from their perspective, you they either don't need to see you anymore or don't need to see you again for a while. Um, but what might not what might get lost in translation is the to be cleared from that context to then be cleared from a physical performance standpoint to return to sport are not the same. And it's it's hard to be the bearer of bad news when having that conversation, right? If, if, if that wasn't totally crystal clear communicated. Yeah. Uh, but then again, it comes back to, if you, if you, you've said already, if you've had that communication, you've been doing that regular testing, none of this is a surprise. It'll almost be a case of you'd love it if they came back and said, I don't know what the surgeon was on about, but they reckon I'm ready to go back again. Definitely not. Am I? <laughs> and that's where you want to be with the patient. So that, that, that athlete has a bit more, self-efficacy and control over their own rehab in an ideal world but i can imagine you, you get some scenarios where they come back and almost it's just there's been an explosion in everything you've worked towards you've then got to kind of pull it back a little bit so yeah very very difficult and and we're dealing with people's livelihoods and lives and yeah that's... and that's the the other thing too is like the and we met teddy mentioned this from the beginning what point of the season are you going to be at at nine months are yeah. you a junior in high school, you know, being recruited to play in college and playoffs are coming up like as much as that shouldn't be the primary factor in the decision. It is part of the decision, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, we're acknowledging your risk of retear is higher if you go back a month earlier. At the same time, we your numbers are looking good. We understand the importance of this point in the season in your career, and so like everything is going to be on the table in that decision. Brilliant, brilliant. So on our list of things to do, as I was thinking, we'd have so much time, but we we maybe haven't. But um, is to to, to cover off. I don't want to cover off. It sounds like I'm sort of putting it to the side. But overhead athletes. So, you know, we, we've talked about the principles and we've really nicely delved into ACLs. Um, do we want to have a think about now how the, the differences maybe, if there are any, in how we're applying these principles to overhead athletes? Travis, you yeah, want to kick I mean, start? Or this, Teddy? Uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief here, but, um, you know, Travis mentioned swimming and a mm -hmm. background that he has and an interest in working with swimmers. Uh, one of the principles that's key here for swimmers is load management. And that's also something that's very hard to intervene from a physio standpoint. You know, the culture of swimming is such that yeah. you get in the water and you do your four or 5,000 yards every morning, you know, no matter what. Uh, and uh, you look at swimming has the highest prevalence of overhead uh, of shoulder injuries of any sport, you know, and, and um, it's just extremely challenging at times, uh, I find. 
to work with swimmers and to work through and around these issues. And sometimes they don't even really need to take that much time off, but they just need to modify what they're doing a little bit. But man, uh, the communication between swimmers and their coaches sometimes isn't the greatest. They're, you know, what they're in the water, the coaches are out of the water. I mean, there's just a lot of, uh, if you, if I didn't swim as a kid, I mean, I did like the swim team with my community pool for a year, but all of the things I've learned about swimming, like the yardage and everything is postgraduate, you know, self-taught. And so I, I find that the load management for me with swimmers, and we work with quite a few, is very challenging and something that um, you have to really kind of educate them on early on the value of it and um, get them to kind of buy in if they're able yeah. to. And try to understand their sport. Ask ask a lot of questions before you tell them what to do. That And the, like Teddy said, the, the culture in swimming is so unique and may, may be true of many endurance sports, but with the shoulder particularly in swimming, it's kind of like pain is a, to the athlete is like a normal and expected part of the process. And so it, where you draw the line of this is hurting more than it should to this is like a normal amount of achiness is, is tough just in light of, Hey, most of us are going to experience pain at, at some point throughout the season. And then the the piece about, well, I can't take a break from training. Um, there, there's like a, this is anecdotal, but they say like for every three days out of the pool or for every one day out of the pool, it takes three days to get back to where you were. And uh, there's probably more rigorous research that, you know, could confirm or deny that. But uh, the idea is, okay, we, we have a really uh, straightforward way of monitoring load in swimming, which is the yardage. And so keeping track of that, but really working with the coaches and the athlete to have that entire conversation of, hey, here's here's what we need to supplement the pool training with. Here's the amount of training that we feel comfortable with them doing in the water. Here's the nature of the training that they should be doing in the water, whether we're pulling back on total yardage or intensity or frequency or equipment use, because we sometimes wear hand paddles, which... Um, maybe put even more load through the shoulder. So yeah. like Teddy said, if you don't have the background in the sport, well, you're going to learn today, right? Because you really do need to understand everything that goes into it. And it's kind of a, a unique beast. And so yeah, getting that education, getting that communication going with the coach and with the athlete, uh, have, helping the athlete feel comfortable having that conversation with the coach, because there's, kind of like that warrior narrative that goes into it of well, I don't want to tell the coach that I'm hurting that might mean that I'm gonna they're gonna have me stay out of practice I don't want to do that they might ask me to miss a meet I don't want to do that so that that's why like the the swimmers are so tight-lipped about it and mm -hmm. you they they finally come to you and you're like oh my god your shoulders practically falling off at this point uh how have you been swimming like this for so long and that that's probably a big part of it Definitely. Uh, so, so you sort of kind of understanding the sport, but also the communication there is a big deal, isn't it? In terms of, I know from anecdotally as well is things like scholarships, things like that, where where there's a lot riding on them being in the pool. But you're looking at a sport where they're not just in the pool three, four, five times a week; they're in the pool multiple times a day, eight, ten times a week. Yeah, mm. yeah. So then that throws a, a whole different issue in terms of load management, which yeah. is a, a key topic we wanted to talk about, actually. Uh, and, and it kind of fits really quite nicely in, into this, this, this subgroup of, of athletes. And it is admittedly hard. Like in other sports, I, th I think you can kind of get some training stimulus without doing the sport itself. And with swimming, it's like as much as you throw somebody on an exercise bike or tell them to go for a run, like, you can be cardiovascularly fit, but it's really not the same. It's a very different beast. And um, so, yeah, how, how to balance that, like Teddy talked about the the stressors uh, versus your adaptation, like it's, it's tricky. Yeah. Something I've had success with uh, is, you know, at least helping them to kind of break down like different strokes and that sort of thing. And this idea of, you know, fly is the hardest stroke. It's the hardest on the body, uh, hardest on the back, hardest on the shoulders, 
um, this idea of like, hey, can we kind of like load wave fly, like do it every, maybe every other day. If they're not competing in fly, if, if they maybe they want to do IM, but they're not regularly doing fly, like how much fly do we really need to do? You know, uh, or even if you're working with somebody that got an athlete a few years ago, this guy was had like a 40 inch vertical. He's an absolute fast twitch freak. Uh, he does 50 meter fly as his, that's what he competes in. You know, it's like this guy is a, a, a 20 second powerhouse and his coach is trying to get him to do 5,000 yards in a practice. He has no business doing that. He's in, he's way beyond his lactate threshold for half that practice. He's just destroying himself. It's like, Hey, can we, can I get you to just slow down? like slow down on that stuff, stay in a little bit closer to an aerobic state, mm -hmm. you know, and that's now we get back into strength conditioning principles, but that's going to help you to recover a lot better. And then you can push yourself more on, on those brief bouts of fly and that sort of thing. And, uh, and, and that's a really strange tradition that like, yeah, still to this day has, has, is very slow to, to change. There's, yeah. there are inroads. Uh, there was one sw so the idea that yardage is king for any swimmer of any uh distance specialization from somebody who's doing the mile which takes 15 20 minutes to somebody who's doing the 50 freestyle which takes 20 seconds everybody's just going to swim in 10 times a week for 2 hours ago and the the thinking is that the more is the better and like that's that's obviously not true, but there have been relatively few examples of people who are doing a lot less, making it to the most elite level. And so it's 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 becoming more of a thing in the last 10, 15 years, but uh still a ways to go. But for for an injured athlete, like that makes even more sense. Like you're only racing yeah. for 22 seconds at a time. Do you right. really need to be doing all of that? How much, what's the the minimum effective dose, at least while you're, <laughs> you know, actively injured that we can keep you fit, but find ways to do it where you're not just pounding yourself. Yeah. There's just this bizarre survivorship bias in swimming. And it exists across a lot of sports and a lot of disciplines uh, where people are like, well, it worked for so-and-so. So, like, right. you know it's worked it's worked up to this point and that's the thing that can get you in the biggest trouble and in, in almost any walk of life if if it worked up to this point i mean maybe it didn't work up to this point what do we what what opportunities are we unaware of that we've left on the table uh in track and field you can't even imagine training your uh endurance or your cross-country athletes the same way as your 100 meter sprinters <laughs> so why are we doing that in swimming it i and i so it's funny because i grew up a swimmer and I didn't get really exposed to track and field until much later. And I was like, what do you mean the the sprinters <laughs> only do so little? Like, I can't, That that's not possible. And then, of course, I found out that it was true. And my like, mine was blown. I was like, I just thought everybody just did as much as they possibly could. And, uh, you know, and <laughs> that, that's, that was only from my, my warped perspective from having right. been a swimmer. Yeah. Yeah, you were... You had this uh, naive idea that everything was was made sense, Travis, and unfortunately, uh, ignorance was bliss. Yeah. <laughs> I think the, sort of the, the the topics you picked up there is it's just a, a basic exercise physiology as well, and it comes back to this understanding of, of of what are we looking at, and when we're talking about load management, having a really good grasp of exercise physiology, you, you know. Teddy, you just mentioned the words there, you know, lactic threshold. And I'd be really interested to, to put a poll out there of listeners of, of how many of us truly understand what a lactic threshold or lactic turn point and things like that is. What 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 measures that? What is it? And why is it important? Um, I don't think we, we're arguing that people need to know the absolute ins and outs of that. But I think having some understanding from a point of yeah. being able to manage load for our athletes is actually really important. Yeah, absolutely. Just appreciating the basics of ex exercise physiology and, and, you know, the zones are kind of an arbitrary label to some, to heart rates or whatnot. And, uh, but just understanding what, what an inflection point in your heart rate response represents and how that uh, might impede your ability to recover. And the fact that a lot of different people, there's a huge variation to, to the tune of like 30 to 40 beats per minute across the board of, of where people stand in terms of uh, their heart rate response and understanding that a highly fast twitch 
gifted athlete might not be able to tolerate the same amount of uh, endurance training as somebody who is much more uh, type one fiber dominant. Mm. And just, you know, uh, I think a base appreciation of that, I think it's, I mentioned earlier at the beginning with ACL rehab, like uh, an American football player versus a soccer player or a European football player, uh, their conditioning and their, you know, tier two work, if you will, uh, for their ACL rehab should be very different from one another. So I think these principles are extremely important in a, in a base way. Uh, but and yeah, it's, it's extremely complex. I don't even understand the whole, the, de the depth of it, uh, you know, but I, that's I why we have exercise physiologists. Like, exactly. <laughs> that's right. right. And they spend their lives doing that. Whereas I'm more focused on injury, but I appreciate yeah. the complexity of it. Yeah. But it's like that, that point you mentioned, it seems simple. It's like, oh, we're going to train our wide receiver distant, different from our linemen. Like that's, that, that, that it's not simple, right? Uh, and so like, oh, sports rehabilitation. Okay. Well, what sport? Okay. Football. Well, okay. What position? Um, yeah. like that, getting th that level of detail is necessary and is not so easy to do. Right. Uh, especially if you're, you're working very broadly with many different sports. Oh, first I have to understand swimming. Then I have to understand the mechanics of butterfly and the practice habits of the athletes within the sport, within this team, like they don't teach you that in school. Right. So uh, they can't, of course, and we already said like, yeah. well, they barely teach you any of this, but it's really up to the practitioner to do the homework of getting that understanding so that, okay, athlete needs to be here by the end of this. How can we get them there most specifically? And that's not just, Oh, they they have an ACL injury. It like it goes way deeper than that. Yeah, but what about my fourteen other patients that I'm seeing today? That's that's when it just gets, yeah yeah. You know, it's it's really hard to it's really hard to go super deep on any one person uh, when you have such a, a long uh, you know a, a wide array of types of patients that you're working with, and that's where we don't you you're not expected as a physio to be an expert in these, in these principles, but just to understand them enough so that you can uh, give people some tools uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, it could be simple for a running program. You could have like two different types of running programs that you give people after an ACL. Uh, Dan Lorenz has a great paper uh, where he has a return to sprint program with just some basic progressions. We have it printed out in our, in both our clinics and we give people kids and say, Hey, or we give it to kids and say, Hey, take a picture of this. You know, like it doesn't, we don't always need to be, so n equals one prescriptive base, but just to understand and just to just to get close, like horseshoes and hand grenades, just get just get close, and it it will still be uh, way better than average. Brilliant. Well, Teddy, Travis, we have hit just over an hour. If you wouldn't believe it, uh, it's been brilliant. Really, really enjoyed this. Uh, can I nudge you both for a takeaway point for the listeners before we we head off? Um, I'll I'll leave it up to whoever's ready for a, for it. One takeaway point at least. You can go with two if you need to. <laughs> I'll I'll hop in first. Travis and I have been like pointing at each other, but we both uh, kept our fingers down for that one. Oh, I'll hop in. Ready. You know, my, I think my my biggest takeaway is uh, that idea of tier one and tier two. Don't forget about the other part of the body. You know, in, phys in physical therapy, we can become myopic or, or very nearsighted on the one injury, injured area. Don't forget about the whole person and uh, work around the injury. Sometimes that can be working around the injury while they regain function can sometimes be just as important or more important than the injury itself. Uh, so that's kind of my important takeaway. And remember, just because they're rehabbing their knee, doesn't mean you're not allowed to do a hamstring exercise. It doesn't mean you're not allowed to. You're not rehabbing a different body part. Insurance will still reimburse. Uh, you're still working towards a goal. Nice. I think uh, I mean, that, that takeaway is is so awesome and so important. And then the other thing that I would add is just the reinforcing the testing piece. Uh, and that is you know we we talked a lot about you need to do it early and you need to do it often so there are no surprises you need to do it rigorously and reliably and you need to practice and the other, the other thing is like well 
we have to figure out what tests we're going to do. And and we we talked a little bit about that for the knee. Um, and that's just one part of the body, right? Like we talked about shoulders and swimming and the upper extremity is a whole different uh, litany of tests out there. And as little agreement as there is about the knee, there's even less agreement I think about uh, what tests are important for the shoulder. So uh, I would just say to like, really do your homework, come up with a, a battery of tests that make sense to you and to your athletes. And then again, practice them, practice them, practice them. Don't be afraid to throw one test out, even if the literature says it's good, because it doesn't seem to provide information that is helpful for you and try something different. Um, but, but try to come up with a, a battery of tests that makes sense and is comprehensive and is giving you the information that you need to, like Teddy said earlier, like call an audible if things aren't heading in the direction that you were anticipating uh, from the, the rehabilitation standpoint to help get them to where you want to get them at the end. Um, but, but make sure you're not just doing the testing for the sake of it, but actually that it's meaningful to you during the course of rehabilitation and then at the end to make the, the decision to go back to school. Brilliant. Teddy, Travis, thank you so much for your time. This has been absolutely fantastic. I've really enjoyed the last hour or so. I think, um, again, I always said about the Physio Explained being sometimes I wanted to carry on the conversation. I never thought, well, an hour, I still want to carry on the conversation. So um, hopefully, I, I know the listeners would have found this really useful. And, and it's probably just kick-started a lot of ideas some things that people can probably go away and think, actually, do you know what? I need to do more of that. Or I've never thought about doing that. So I think it's going to be really, really useful for, for listeners. Um, and I would advise them to, to check you guys out on, on social media on, and, and I'm sure you'd be, be happy for, for people to, um, to connect with you across mm -hmm. different networks as well. Absolutely. So it's been great. I shall leave you to the rest of your day. Thank you so much, both of you. And uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure our listeners will be hearing from you again on one of our other platforms. So once again, thank you very much from the Physio Network. Thanks, James. Thanks, James.